All right, all you on the mark tribe fans, if it's time to improve your short game, and I've got the man, Daniel Grieve, Dan Grieve, on the podcast with us. Dan, you told me off the air that it's an Indian summer in the UK right now. Uh, it's always an Indian summer there, man. How are you doing? No, I'm good, thank you, Mark. Very good. Yeah, we've, we've uh, enjoying an extended summer this year. So the courses have just greened up. It's been really dry. Uh, summer and, 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 and a very hot summer, but um, we've had a little bit of rain and it's greened up and it's perfect for playing conditions right now. Well, it's funny you say that because I spend a lot of time on your Instagram feed. Let me be honest, folks, and you should go and check <laughs> it out. Um, you got the beautiful short game area there. You chip between these pine trees and these hardwoods and pitch shots and stuff. It looks awfully, awfully lush and green over there right now. I mean, it's Woburn's a good spot and that's where you base, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, very lucky to be at Woburn. Um, been there uh, 16, 17 years now, actually. Nice. So a long time. Been head pro there about six years. And uh, yeah, you're referring to the Tavistock short game area, which is without doubt one of the best short game facilities anywhere, anywhere in Europe, I would guess, uh, potentially the world. And uh, designed by Manuel Pinero, who's obviously renowned for his own short game. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was designed to sort of give it a Woburn feel, so you play through the pine trees. Yeah, it's a very popular spot with our golfers. I was introduced to it by Stacey Bregman, Close the yeah, okay yeah i teach i teach Stacey. yeah no yeah. <laughs> anyway so whenever I, she sends me these pictures i'm like where are you and she goes i'm with uh -huh. anyway um, she's a great she's a great bunker player Stacey. she's a good girl all south africans are great bunker players hey, yeah, indeed. before we go further i i want to for our audience you've told us somewhere you're based and such dan grieve golf instructor uh, was obviously Dan Grieve golfer back in the day, I'm assuming. Tell us about the quick journey to where you are now. Yeah, I mean, I've gone into a golfing family, really. I played golf all my life, uh, so well over 40 years now. And um, I was a good golfer, you know, I could, I could play nicely. Always really enjoyed the short game side of things. You know, a long game for me, never really a great strength. Um, and I guess I was kind of lucky that I was brought up in Yorkshire, very, really strong golfing county. You know, you've got uh, around sort of summertime as, as Danny Willett, really, and, and all these amazing players. And I thought I could play a little bit and competed okay. Ne always knew I was never really in the same camp as these guys. Mm -hmm. So really got my teeth into, into the teaching side of things um, and then and then progressed that way, really. But I um, still love playing, still really enjoy trying to get better. But I actually get more enjoyment these days from missing greens and trying to get up and down almost and making the hoodies. You know, I do, I do love that side of the game. I think there's something in human nature where, you know, we're more we're more sort of um, intense on trying to save something than trying to gain something. So I love the fact in short game, you're trying to save that shot. And I, lo I love that sort of side of it. I want to ask this, not that we have to sell it because people are obviously downloading this one to improve their short games. But mm -hmm. you know, I work as an announcer on the PGA tour, and, you know, the strokes gain metrics and such. You've seen it. You work with professional golfers, you know, strokes gained is saying, well, if you drive it farther, you got the advantage on the competition. Look, that goes without saying. But the truth of it all, and you work with major champions even, um, I don't care how well you hit it, if you can't save it because you're going to miss, you're never going to amount to everything you desire. Um, are we on the same page here, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. I mean, I think once you get to get your game to a certain level, mm -hmm. you're always going to sort of play okay. It is all about your ability to score around the green and the ability to save shots. And I think if we bring it back to the amateur golfer, if they just kept a really simple stat, which was every time they missed a green, how many shots did it take them to get that ball in the hole? And I think like people would be surprised. I think, I think, I think, it, I think it would probably average something for some players, 3.2, 3.3 shots. And if you could get that average between 2.5 and 2.8, for, for an average 18 handicapper, you'd be amazed at how many shots that would save, save, save from your round. Yeah. You are talking my language man my hero I, i've got various um but m the patriarch of all my heroes would be bob jones and uh, mm -hmm. in one of his books he said the key to golf is turning three strokes into two and yeah uh, that's exactly what you say because most of the golfers listening to this if you are truthful and you keep numbers you'll find that you're taking more than three on average to get down around the greens exactly how many times do we take two chips or two bunker shots or a bunker shot and a chip you know if you can just get that thing on the green and take no more than three shots and occasionally take two and every now and again chip one in mm -hmm. that's the key you don't turn, have to turn to sevy you know you've just got to start making sure you don't you don't hit it outside 20 feet and i think everyone listening should be able to do that with the right understanding i'm so glad you say that and uh, the don't 
let's make this a marching audio. Don't try and think you're savvy because there are just certain shots that they're kind of laced with disaster if you're not careful. These are around the greens. And you've got to just get it up there and allow your putter to be the superstar at times. You know, you don't have to hit the miraculous shot, correct? Oh, absolutely. And I think there's almost uh, uh, people think there's an unwritten rule in the rule book that it says, you know, thou must always go for the for the pin or always, always try and get it close. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're hitting it past the pin or if you've got a bad lie, even maybe going around the bunker at times or whatever it is, it's just trying to take that sort of uh, that desire to always hit that uh, that champagne shot out. Champagne shot. <laughs> I love that. I'm actually going to use that on the air in 2023. This champagne shot. <laughs> okay, um, Dan, let's 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 get into the mechanics of this all because I've done short game podcasts. I, I'm a big one on going for the low hanging fruit. I'm preaching that all of the time, and the short game is kind of low hanging fruit. Um, and we've talked about concepts and, and and shots and stuff like that, but no one's really dug into kind of the nitty gritty of it all so folks i reached out to dan i'm like i want to do the mechanics of three short game shots the chip and run the basic one the pitch shot the basic pitch shot and just a floating lob shot uh, not even the super lob shot just a nice one that can bring the ball down softly and you were like cool let's get into this so you're ready to go shall i, mm -hmm. shall, shall I toss yeah it? sure ask away yeah okay. yeah the mechanics folks we're going to go through we're going to go through stance width, grip alignment ball position posture weight distribution body rotation and how much uh swing length wrist action club selection all right okay. let, let's kick it off and i'll just cue you dan so the basic chip and run to start this off at sort of the thirty-six thousand foot level let's let's go stance stance with body alignment ball position just before the the swing the swing is even made describe what the chip and run requires from that point of view yeah, absolutely. I think I think what you say, Mark, about creating these three shots is so important because I do, I do sort of one or two short game schools a week. People come from all over the place, and I always start each each short game school with a very simple assessment. I give them four shots, and so three of them are the shots you've required, and I give them right. a bunch of shots as well. Okay, right. and I basically just all I've got to do is play two shots from each station, and they move around, mm -hmm. and I see the same mistakes over and over again. It's basically just a total lack of understanding and a total lack of versatility being able to change things i think i think golfers kind of have an idea of what the ingredients should be for each shot yeah but they mix them up all the time and it, <laughs> it, 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 they just mix them up so they're trying to play a high shot and i sort of like, trying to play a low shot or you know they're playing from the same the same way and i always teach short game from two perspectives number one the technical bit which we'll get into but i think which is equally important is your golfing IQ, it's your golfing intelligence. Because if you don't understand bounce, if you don't understand what the lie will do to the ball, if you don't understand the shot in front of you, what the slope's doing, which club to use, then it really plays through in the mechanics of the swing. Mm -hmm. So I think all times in short game, you've got to have in your mind, it's technical and it's IQ and you've got to marry the two. Yeah. If you can do that, I think that's absolutely vital. But well, the I, um, the low I, shot... Yeah. I'm glad you go there uh, because, uh, and this gets into club selection, because oftentimes your sand wedge with a whole bunch of bounce is not the best idea off a hard pan or uh, whatever the case might be. So yeah, it's, it's selecting the appropriate club. And you make such a good point, and this is why, and I've seen this in your social media, the way you interact with your students, um, where you talk about... You, you get there and it's like almost one size fits all, no matter what they're intending to go in their head. And they don't have a clear picture about what the shot required is anyway, that they just pull a club and they're just having a happy swing. And there's no idea of, I want the ball to go this high or land there or run this far. They're just swinging away and kind of playing hopeful for the next, for the shot somehow working out. Yeah, without doubt. I, think, I don't think hope's a great plan, is it? And I think most people are just <laughs> going with hope. There's no, there's no real um, understanding behind what they're trying to do. There's no real painting of pictures. You know, I hear Tiger and Jack all the time talking about painting the picture of the shot before they play it. And I try and get encourage, encourage people to do that. I'll ask questions and say, what's that slope? Well, it's, it's an upslope. Probably not a good idea to use your sand wedge or your lob wedge because if you're trying to run one out, it's going to get stuck in the slope. And I see that all the time. That's probably the biggest fault. And the easiest thing in for the chip and run shot is just get less loft in your hand. I do think that over time, I mean, going back 30 years when I was a junior, maybe I'm looking back the roast tinted glass, I don't know, but I definitely remember 
my peers using 789 irons a lot more than I see today. I think it's totally out of fashion these days to do it. Except for the coolest, to... except for the coolest golfer, you, you, you can go and do it at Woburn. I'll do it wherever I go. Just toss it at any random golfer. Say, who's your favorite golfer? You're gonna get Tiger Woods a whole bunch, right? Mm -hmm. And I've called. I've I've been on course announcing Tiger Woods, and that guy will go with eight iron, seven iron, six iron, more than you think. I've seen yeah. 20, 30, 40 yard bunker shots with a laid open eight iron. He's exactly. as creative as anyone, and everyone wants to dress like him, act like him and stuff, but they won't go and do the club selection variation around the greens like he does. Yeah, so you saw it this year at the Open Championship, obviously, they were using all sorts of irons. We've been so, and uh, yeah, I've been so firm. And I do think, just, just uh, I do say this to everyone as well, the 60 degree, although it's um, useful, I've got one in my bag, I do think in big red capital letters on the back, every 60 degree log wedge has come with for emergency use only on the back. <laughs> I, love I, think, I, th I think if people could remember that because people use it way too much and I see some people trying to play a 20 yard chip and run with a 60 in the hand I'm already feeling nervous because the length of swing they've got to put on that the amount of shafting they're going to put in which is just going to totally destroy the bounce and how that club plays mm -hmm. you can chip that way but you've got to be perfect and when you start getting less loft in your hand you don't need to be perfect I don't know about you Mark I'd rather stand over a chip knowing that I don't need to be perfect I feel a lot more relaxed than mm -hmm. trying to be perfect Two of those things, uh, folks, this, don't worry, Dan, this happens with my podcast all the time because it's like fireside chats and people talking golf. We start here and we end there. So. <laughs> okay. Um, I've, I taught Larry Myers for a good five years from off the PGA tour onto the champion store. Yeah. Obviously the architect of probably arguably the greatest chip pitch shot in the history of golf. Yeah. Of 11th Norman. Yeah. The Masters. Yeah. And then I've spent a lot of time with Steve Stricker, who is a fantastic wedge player. Those two guys never swing wedges hard. And Larry Myers, to this day, his entire career has never had any more than 56 degrees of loft in his bag. Wow, that's amazing. And, and I don't know, say seven, say seven never had more than 55 in his bag. Yeah, because these guys, you can open the thing up. But your point is when you start turning the lofted wedge down, that big thing becomes like a huge backhoe and it just becomes exactly. bigger. And then you wonder why you're chunking balls. Yeah, I do think as well also when you have a lot of loft in your hand, there's an instinctive uh, sort of uh, feel where you can actually, you're actually um, incentivized to take loft off. Yeah. If you have a stronger loft, you can, you're incentivized to release, release it weaker. Mm -hmm. So I've said to start with a stronger loft and release it weaker rather than a weak loft and go stronger. Well, I, I would. Well, I'm then assuming by listening to you that because I see so many club golfers where, and this is getting to length of swing, we're all over the show. Forgive me, folks, where they've got too much loft, they're going to propel the ball a certain distance, they're swinging back entirely too far to generate energy. Then they get mm -hmm. to the top of the backswing, there and they're like, holy cow, this is too much. Then they end up on the thing, and they see exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then your friends are like, Yo, Bob, you're decelerating. And Bob, if you didn't, would crank the thing straight over the green. So they're caught between you know, two shots again, and that gets to your original assessment of shot. Yeah, that's absolutely. I do think there's a myth as well that you have to accelerate through short game shots. I don't know about you. I, I think if you just have a nice smooth tempo, that's fine. You don't need to accelerate. Really. Right. You know, in fact, I think a lot of guys on tour actually decelerate on some of their shots. They do. They, 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 <laughs> they honestly do because a lot of the golfers don't really understand you know, force is a function of mass and acceleration. That dude mm -hmm. Isaac Newton said so. We're most yeah, are thinking speed, right? Okay. Um, okay. Let right, me should get, go back to that. Yeah. Let me get me back on audio. So, so let's yeah. do this because you can just contrast them. Okay. So we'll go the chip shot, the chip and run, the pitch shot, the lob shot. Talk about stance width and ball position as those three shots contrast each other, please. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and he's demonstrating for those folks listening. I'll you quite see feet, but <laughs> if you turn, if you turn the club this way round, so so sort of um, lengthways there, and you put that between the middle of your feet, yeah, that's that's the stance with I like to see for any basic chip and run shot. So what? Because it's quite narrow. So one second. So what, folks? For the folks listening in the car, keep your eyes on the road, okay? But listen, Daniel there has just demonstrated he's turned his lofted wedge on its side, so he's measuring from heel to toe, and that is the width between the insteps of his feet for all chip. Chip shots, pitch shots, green side shots. Yes, for every for every chip and run shot. Okay, all right, perfect. So every any, chip and run shot because it's a relatively shot. short swing. Okay, right, cool. Relatively short swing, so it traps the center of gravity, and I and I do like that front foot 
to be slightly flared out. And I think that's really important. That's that's low hanging fruit. That. If you get your front foot slightly turned out to around about 11 o'clock for a right handed golfer, that's going to give you critically, uh, it's going to give you two things, but critically it's going to give you a pivot line that runs from the shoulder through the hip, through the knee into the foot. Because I think most golfers try and do the right thing. They push the weight forward in the upper body, at lower body, but then the upper body tips back. back yeah. And that creates a big shoulder tip, tip there. No, when you get a shoulder down. tip, you can't rotate through the ball, and that's why people flip. I think that's the, the root cause of a lot of things is shoulder excessive shoulder tilt, which is great if you're hitting a driver, but not if you're hitting a chip. Amen. Hey, you know what? I think it's so cool that to talk about the foot flare because most golfers they're so nervous of these short shots that they get over there and they're trying to get it over with in a in a hurry, as opposed to saying, just pay attention, not just where you're aiming, but how you're setting up to stack the odds in your favor. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And when you when you open that foot as well, it's going to just allow the hip to sort of be a bit more external. So it's going to allow you to rotate through the ball a lot easier. So that's such an easy little thing to do. So narrow stance, open that left foot out a little bit. Make sure you feel like you've, your shoulders are nice and level. Yeah. Okay. So your level shoulders, which is to do with this creating this pivot line. And I think wrist angles are also really important to yeah. make sure that you don't get the uh, the wrist sitting too low. Okay. For this shot, you want to feel like really from the top of the forearm bone to the top of the thumb, that's almost dead flat and that kind of discourages wrist hinge you don't want that much wrist hinge for a low for a low running shot mm -hmm. so so essentially the folks the, what dan's got there is narrow stance lead foot open slightly handle of the club raised up so you're standing a bit closer to the ball and it's almost like yeah. the heel of this of, of the sole of the club is raised off the turf a touch correct yeah you just take it off a little bit the toes are much friendlier place on the club than the heel so if you do <laughs> get a little heavy it's gonna move it's gonna move through um and uh, you're also asking about ball position, weren't you? So, so ball position is an interesting thing. So I do see a lot of players playing that ball way too far back, as we kind of alluded to earlier. And the, and the more you take that back, obviously, you're not only deal off in the club, you're also taking the bounce off the club. Yeah. So you're, you're making that lead and to play very strong. So I like the ball to be just back of centre. And if you've got a little bit of writing on your grip, if you put that in the middle of the ball, that would be sufficient amount of lean. So very so let, so, tough yeah exactly so, so say for example you are using a, a loft a lofted club to chip because you haven't got very far to go and you've got 10 degrees of bounce if you just lean it forward five degrees you've still got five degrees of bounce on the club but you're just taking a little bit off just to kind of pinch it and give it a little low shot lovely um I, I'm, I'm zipping through the whole thing for the shot because it's a basic shot to me it's it's kind of the savior of all of all stuff if you can learn this um and you'll find the more you learn it, folks, the more you want to try it and use it in different situations. Uh, I want to talk to you about body rotation because if you turn on the internet anywhere, anytime, and you search golf instruction, you're hearing bowed wrists and body rotation. I mean, that's like the worldwide mantra mm -hmm. right now. Sure. And I cringe because it's so myopic. Talk to me about body rotation or lack thereof on this little chip shot, please. Yeah, so you're, you're talking about long game there, we obviously in terms no, of we're talking about long swing. game. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, so in long game, yeah, with the wrist flexing down and rotation, obviously, you know, people like DJ popularize that, and, and people are kind of the fashions in long game coaching. Um, but in short game, that's just a total nightmare. If you start flexing that wrist down, you're taking loft and bounce off the club when you go back. And yeah. I see this a lot in players, particularly good players, where they're taking their long game into their short game. Mm -hmm. I do think you've got to separate the games, and, and so a little bit of cupping that wrist there is really important. Um, and, and rotation of the body, for me, it, it's there in short game. It's important, but it has to flow. It doesn't want to drive through. I do see a lot of people getting back and they're trying to force the body through and it, and, it, and it gets players playing too quickly, throws a little bit of havoc and where the bottom of the arc is. I like to feel like the club is swinging and releasing. And as that happens, the, the, the club gets the body reacting and gets the body rotating through a little calmer. Mm -hmm. So you do end up almost facing the target, but really it's a reaction to the release of the club head yeah. as opposed to too much of a conscious you know, movement. I mean, if I had to be or draw some sort of an anecdote, if you were just tossing a ball underhanded to someone and you stopped your finish, your body would have moved, but it's not like you're thinking of moving your body to get there. No? Yeah, exactly. So it's chain reaction. Yeah. I think mean, it's so important in golf that you don't you don't try to analyze everything. A lot of it just just reacts from it from a sequence of movement. If you if you set up correctly, if you get the club on a good plane going back, the club's going to release, and as it releases, it'll it'll allow your body to 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 swing through. One thing I would say in the finish for the chip and run, 
if you hold your finish, which you'd always do, firstly, mm -hmm. sort of, uh, it's, it's, it's good to try and encourage the finish to swing, and also you look better if you hold your finish. But um, the butt of the grip should point somewhere near the left, the left hip in the follow through. Yeah, and that's what I call that's what I call release one. It's just in a way of defining that release. So we're not we're not here. We're not kind of driving the handle forward, which a lot of people do. And likewise, we're not flipping it for the chip and run. Somewhere near that left hip in the follow through, we have a good place to finish. So essentially, just a little handle leading there, because if you let the head go a bit more, the butt of the club will be pointing at your belly button, maybe not your left. Oh, buckle, yeah, exactly. And that's good if you want to hit a little bit higher, but obviously not if you're trying to play the low flighted shot, which is which is key to to the discipline and the the definition between the shots. Okay, I, I'm going to ask this because I, I don't want to I don't want it to sound trite, but I think people misunderstand swing length. But I guess if they start experimenting with less lofted clubs, they'll learn to swing shorter very quickly, almost by necessity. Yeah. So talk to me about this this basic chip and run shot. Yes, it's governed by how far you want to propel the ball, but, but, but what would you recommend? Because I see so many golfers trying to make a big follow through because someone's told yeah, them to go down on the thing. Yeah, no, exactly. And it, it all comes back to this thing we talked about earlier where people believe they've got to accelerate through. If you look at the very best players when they play the chip and run, without doubt, the ratio between backswing and through swing is a longer backswing to a shorter follow through. Yes. And that's why that, that sort of, I like the word pinch for one of these shots. You're trying to pinch it. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're not digging, but it's a gentle pinch when you play this shot. So your follow through wants to be, be short. That's at the left hip. And it's really not going above the knee height, really, in the follow through. It's a nice reference point. So it's a little bit longer here. The left shoulder pushes it away, but then you just, nipping that follow through a little bit shorter for this shot beautiful and then go get some balls and practice them around the greens folks it's a fun shot club selection you can do it with anything huh yes yeah oh yeah i think as a practice drill i mean some of the players i work with we have real fun we'll, we'll, we'll take the three iron through to the sand wedge and, and and try and play to every hole on the green and you'd be amazed sometimes how sometimes a five iron will beat the wedge yeah because you also then got to start thinking more than just okay, I want to get the ball close. You're thinking of the entire journey, like where does this thing have to touch down first and how much is it rolling? Yeah, absolutely. I, and and that's, that's what I see a lot. I do think most amateurs are obsessed with the flag. Yeah. I'm not about really where they want to land the ball and how the ball gets to the flag. To and the, you've got to get immersed in the whole picture of the shot. To this day, I referenced Gary, uh, Larry Myers earlier who can still chip it like a banshee, right? Um, he, he's practiced drill all the time. He takes his golf towel which is not big. It's just a few um, inches back and forth because it sets on the green and just tries to land balls on that towel with a wedge. and with Yeah, a wedge. great drill. Land yeah. there. And so it's all about the carry and how hard he has to hit. Okay, yeah. that was, we've sort of dealt with the chip and run, you know, the, the, the start of it all. Then leveling up the pitch shot, a little more flight, a little less roll. Talk to us there about stance width, about ball position, alignment, that sort of stuff to kick us off, please. Yeah, sure. So I think the important thing, again, coming back to understanding, the chip and run, you are trying to get the ball first, right? If you don't and you've got good technique, it's still okay. You know, the bounce will help you a little bit. Yeah. But for this shot here, I think the most important thing is to understand you're not really trying to hit the ball first. <laughs> so that's the important thing because most golfers <laughs> are always trying to hit the ball first, maybe unless they're in a bunker. I love you. So... Yeah. So, I, I, I've got to share this because I'm laughing. If you're watching this on YouTube, I nearly fell off my chair when Dan said this because I'm sure a lot of golfers are thinking the same way. They're like, this guy's lost his mind. Um, anyway, so uh, I might have been last year. I put this on Instagram. I get this cool gadget. It's kind of green. It's a board. You put it on the ground, got sequins in front of it, and it's got a place where you touch down, right? And when you hit it there, the sequins flip over so you can see where your divot is. Yeah. I do a yeah, thing yeah, where yeah. I'm like fat, thin, and just right. And the just right one has the ball showing, and I've touched down with this wedge, just a whisker in front there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, just right. My Lord, did the Twitter sphere come after me and go, you don't know what you're <laughs> talking about stuff. And I was like, people, you don't know the shot that I'm trying to demonstrate over here. If I'm looking yeah, for yeah. a floating pitch shot, I'm, I, I'm sort of the, the clubs bruising the turf just before the ball. Yeah, totally. There's no way you're going to get the ball landing with finesse and spin if you hit the ball first. For, for the sort of 15, 20, you just, you just can't do it. And, and again, it comes back to the confidence. If you are hitting behind the ball, and I can actually hit, I, I think the perfect distance behind the ball is about an inch. It's, it's kind of a good sole width behind the ball. 
Yeah. This is obviously hugely lie dependent, this shot. If yeah. it's firm, this isn't the shot, right? Let's assume we've got a nice lush condition and you've got an okay lie. It doesn't need to be an amazing lie, but it has to be okay. As in the leading edge sits a little bit under the ball. Yeah. Um, so you, uh, one inch, but you know, even if you hit two inches, it's good. Three inches will still get on the green. Four inches will still get on the green. So most golfers listening, hopefully, can hit within four inches of the ball. And that's really all you've got to do to be able to play this shot. If, crucially, if you've got the bounce on the club. Exactly. Because if you take the bounce off the club from your backswing, you know, like you, you arch the wrist, um, then not, and you hit four inches behind, the ball's not going anywhere. Exactly. So as long as the bounce is engaged, you, so that's where it begins. I think you've got to hit the as ground first. As, and, and as long as you're not excessively wristy through contact too, because if you're bottoming out just a whisker prior, and the handle stops and that forward wrist buckles down, then the leading edge gets yeah. exposed a bit too much. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you need you need you know decent contact there. But um, and that's just allowing the club to flow a little bit more. But yeah, in terms of the basics, I would I would go for a wider stance now because the swing's gonna go a little bit longer. So I'd now go to two club heads. Okay, a little, between huh? the middle of the feet. Yeah, just that's all, just two club heads. That's all. You know, because most people stand way too wide, they have too much long game bias in their short game. Uh -huh. So if you come in, go from one for a chip and run, go for two for this for this shot. I would say this is 10 to sort of 30 yards I call it a soft landing shot around the green all right okay and really the key here is ball position most play, people play this too far back that encourages sharp lean okay and they use too much loft so going back to what you what you were saying earlier about loft I like players to play this with their second most lofted club okay so generally a 54 or a 56 all right um, well maybe in a 52 for this shot is a good idea um, and play the ball, yeah, just forward to centre. Very important as well that you don't have any shaft lean here. You want the shaft straight up and down. Mm -hmm. And just begin to stand a little further away from the ball. So when you stand further away from the ball, the hand starts to drop a little bit low and you start getting more of an angle between the forearm and the top of the thumb there. And that angle is going to, without you actively trying to, it's going to give you a little bit more wrist set for free. It yeah. just kind of happens naturally. So you're not trying to manually set the wrist because I find so many folks that clubs move just a few inches from the ball. And the next thing they consciously loading on those wrists and the club's standing up and then they're yeah. like, Oh my goodness, the club heads up here and the ball's down there. And then oh, you know. dangerous. Yeah. I, I like to sort of say one of the things I say is wide to slide, you know, to slide that club, you've got to feel like you get the width. There is some gentle wrist hinge, but the width and allowing your hands to travel further back to this shot, gives you all this time then to come back to the ball so the butter grip can start working back up towards you mm -hmm. and it allows it to release a little bit more. But yeah, when you start just setting the wrists, you've got an awful lot of unloading to do in such a, such a short space of time. Yeah, I'm knowing where you're going. Yes, I'm going to say folks thinking about body rotation. Dan is likely to say to you, correct me if I'm wrong, that there's no conscious rotation. Once again, you following the width or, or the, the mass, the, the, the flow of this wide swing arc. To the finish, correct? Yeah, exactly. I, I call this uh, a gravity shot, really. So, if you, and this is why I think grip pressure is really important. So, you've got to make sure you grip it light, especially light for this shot. I think ninety-nine percent of golfers in short game grip it too tight. By the way, all right, comes from anxiety. Uh, you got to you got to soften the arms. Um, one of my one of my favorite short game players to watch over has been Ernie Els, right? So, if you watch Ernie Ernie Chip, his his hands are so soft on the club, and his arms had almost like a a natural arm hang. They had a slight flex in the elbows. He was never straight with his arms. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the arms hang much, much softer. I think most people can get a lot from that. Much softer there. And if you take it back, the weight of the club head, if you're light enough, the club will swing on its own. It's like I'm waiting for gravity to take over. The club starts to swing, and I just gently pass through to the target. There's no active unloading or, or sort of flip of the wrist. It really is just the swings on its own momentum. The club is just swinging. Okay, there's no force. There's no trying to manipulate the club. For the folks who are listening on audio, Dan just had the club in his right hand and was holding the grip cap and just allowing the club head to swing back and forth like a pendulum. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sort of gathering, like you talked about release number one, where the handle was leading somewhere and it followed through, it was pointing at your front hip, your left hip, mm -hmm. or right hander. This one would be kind of pointing around your middle some. Would this be release two? Am I putting this is what this is what I call release two. Yeah, so this is where the butt of the grip now coming back to impact. Basically, it returns to where it started because we had the ball position a bit forward and the sharp up and down. The butt of the grip was pointing at the belt buckle at address. Mm -hmm. Impact it returns behind the ball crucially, as we said, and then from there, as you gently rotate, 
the hand arc isn't particularly wide here. The, I like to feel like your triceps stay on your rib cage as you chip as you as you chip it, and the butter grit's pointing back at the belt buckle. So you get a lovely bit of cup in your left wrist, and that's what creates that spin and that finesse and stops that ball jumping off the club face, to, you know, too hot. But it's not a, a lot of people confuse this shot as a flick. It's not a flick. It's just the energy of the club had swinging. Yeah. The uh, the situation of the mass, the weight of the body. I, I'm I'm assuming that it's just gently onto the forward side, but there's no heavy leaning that way. It's certainly not going backward, right? Yeah, exactly. So there's a slight change from chip and run. I, I still like to feel like you've got your weight predominantly left with a lower body, mm -hmm. but the the upper body can just gently come back a little bit for this shot because the bottom of the arc is a little bit more before the ball. So you can kind of soften that right elbow there uh, and, and right shoulder a little bit lower. Um, yeah, I don't like that stacked look. That's that's too steep, particularly yeah. for this shot, which is a shallower attack. Wonderful. So it sounds, uh, look, folks, if you're watching this, you will see everything about Dan. There's a softness to what he's doing. And and it looks it looks to me like, Dan, you advocate that with most golfers around the greens too. And there's the light grip pressure, it's never like you hasty to to make contact with the ball either. You're allowing this club to just move around its arc in its time. Am, am I right about this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when, when I play short game shots, it feels like like the transition between the backswing and the downswing like takes forever. Okay. You know, you got to be you got to be super patient. You just got to be super patient and let the club swing. And I know it's hard for people because a lot of people are anxious around the, when they play and they're trying to get too controlling. But just you can just let it go a little, let the club swing a little bit more. That's a practice thing. That's a practice swing. Yeah, practice swing. Right? And the other one as well, a great drill for people is just take take your thumbs off the grip. So hold it more on your fingers. And if you just swing with the thumbs off the grip, it gives you a much better awareness of the club head. Hmm. So right. if you could just do practice swings without the thumbs on, and then try some with the, hitting the ball with the thumbs off, it'd be uh, that would that'd help a lot of people. Just make sure no one's on the other side of the pitching green when you start. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Okay, let's go into the one that everyone tries to hit all the time. Most folks are not pulling it off if they're keeping your statistics. <laughs> let's go down to the lower one, uh, the lob shot. Just walk us through there from ball position, width, et cetera, et cetera, please. Yeah, I mean, this is massively about the golfing IQ side in terms of reading the line. Most people try and hit lob shots from lies that really aren't suitable so you need you need to have a lie where you know the club can work under the ball um there are other ways we can talk about if you, if you are trying to hit it high from say a hard pan lie there's other techniques but if we sort of aim this at the sort of the average golfer i would definitely suggest you have some grass under the ball to play this shot mm -hmm. okay and uh because it's a longer swing now you'll be going you'll be going fairly wide almost driver width really okay you know, super super wide and that's going to allow you to really put the pressure forward because most people have too much horizontal force they have too much side to side movement when they play this shot and that's counterintuitive too because they're thinking to get this thing in the air and then they're starting to lean backward where you're like nah wider lean a little forward because i'm yeah. going to just present this club landing in the right place and the loft has got the rest yeah exactly so you get you get the width then when, when you're as wide as that you you can really feel like you can actually get lower to the ground as well which is which is really important it's very difficult to get your hands sitting low and lots of knee flex if you don't have that width with, right. with the stance there. So really feel like now this is this is where you'd have the most exaggerated wrist set of, of three now. So the hands really sit quite low. That cups the wrist even more. And the upper body, depending on the lie, but if the, if the lie is okay, you can afford to allow your upper body to come back a little bit. But lower body has to be almost 80% forward of the weight, I would say, in the lower body for this shot. And if we were contrasting the three shots, folks, for the folks who haven't been watching and are just listening, as we've gone from the chip and run through the pitch shot to the lob shot, the shaft angle that address, not leaning forward and backward, this is just talking about vertical. Chip and run is almost the most vertical, pointing up and down. Mm -hmm. The pitch yep. shot is a little more a tilted. Yep. And then the lob shot has got the handle, the lowest of the bunch of them. So again, to your point, it's people setting up to, they're thinking one shot, but they're set up for another where you have to be very precise with how you set up to this. Exactly. And this is what I come back to talking about mixing ingredients up because so most people carry long game into short game. So if they're trying to play a basic chip and run, they'll be standard as if they're hitting a full seven iron, for example. Yeah. And they're just trying to hit the ball 10 yards. So the hands get too low, which is great if you're in a full swing, but not great if you're in a chip and run. So you've got to be really, really careful. You don't mix, mix the ingredients up. And the thing is, when you do start dropping the handle, 
you do have to open that face a little bit more, which I know some people get a little bit scared of, but you're not really opening the face because just the face plain tilt. Um, if you, I'll put a T-peg on the face here. So if, if I have the club at a standard uh, angle here, the, the grooves on the face and the loft on the face pointing in the same direction. Yeah, exactly. but if I start to lower it, obviously the T-peg starts going left. So you need to open the face a bit more. So a lot of people get scared. It feels like it's open, but it's not actually open. It looks open because the grooves point to the right. Yeah. I think that's an important point. A lot of people get that wrong. Great. Um swing length <laughs> and wrist action because you know everyone will watch a, a, a phil mickelson or whoever you know these virtuosos essentially around the green and there's phil will talk about hinge and release and exposing the bounce and all this stuff and i watch club golfers they bouncing clubs all over the place and balls are ricocheting all over the jo joint yeah talk to me about swing length and then the wrist action because i'm assuming with you it will be fairly passive yeah, exactly. So, you know, it's a longer swing. You do, you know, there's no getting away. It's a brave shot. You know, you, you are going to have to take it back further. There is some wrist hinge, but again, but how the mechanics you set at address are going to give you a lot of that wrist hinge for free. Gotcha. And, and then as you come down, there is a certain unloading. You do need to make sure you're not going to pull yeah. this way because that's going to dig the edge in. So there is a bit of a flow, but you know, if you set the club like this, the club wants to swing. And then from there, your body just supports that and, Try and stay fairly passive in the lower body. Let's not sort of dry through too hard because, again, you can likely to thin it there if you do that. Because unlike most, obviously with club selection, you're going with your most lofted wedge. Um, but unlike most of these shots, this is, look, not that landing spot or where the club bottoms out is, is not important in every one. But where this one touches down, this club on this shot, is almost paramount to importance because if it's landing early or late, what you're expecting or hoping for is not going to uh, come to fruition. Yeah, totally. So, you know, don't be afraid of hitting behind the ball one to two inches behind the ball. And that should be sufficient enough just to get it, um, you know, popping up, popping up How softly, Land, landing, landing softly. You've done a great job of, you know, sharing some drills, like for the chip and run, varying clubs, trying to hit the ball the same distance for feel, learning how the ball, you know, flies, feels, uh, for the pitch shot, practice swings and stuff, letting, feeling the flow of the club, um, the bruise of the club on the turf. This lob shot, it's kind of hard to practice. Uh, what sort of drill or advice would you have for the folks listening to go and try and iron yeah. out this shot? Yeah, a really good one. Because I, I think the biggest problem here is players do, don't keep the loft and bounce on the club sufficiently. So yeah, the, left, the left wrist arch is down and, and, it, and it turns over. So for, for the lob shot, if you just very simply, if you take a club back and, and check the club face if it's pointing more or less back at you at the top of the back swing that would be good that means you've got lost and bounce still on yeah. and then as you go through if that club face is looking back at you in the follow through that's also a good sign and the face hasn't turned over a little bit like might, might do in full swing yeah, exactly. so you could just really feel that you're keeping that loft on back and through and that's just a nice awareness drill really of, of how you keep the loft on the club yeah um I love it. I, I must ask this about the shot too. Um, you too, I love your term mixing ingredients. Um, and you've got the wider stance, the body's a little forward, but then people kind of lose their, their idea of where the ball position is. And I also sent, see golfers setting up way too open for this because they got yeah. that face laid a bit open. Talk about ball position and body alignment on this, please. Yeah, it's a good, good, good point on the body alignment. I mean, I think historically people have been taught to sort of stand open on lob shots and bunker shots. You know, it's the right. same yeah. same sort of shot, really. And the problem if you do that, it's so hard to control distance because you're swinging so far left. You've got to hit it about three times harder when you're swinging that far across because the energy is going across the ball. The ball starts going diagonally up the face too much. So if you, I would actually be totally square for this shot. You know, I mean, your toe line is going to be a bit open because you're flaring that foot, but your heel line wants to be totally square. Mm -hmm. um uh, you know you know what was the other question mark sorry no in the ball position too because ball position yeah but crisscrossing yeah. lines and then the ball positions all over the show yeah exactly so ball position i would just have that just just forward of, of center towards the left heel all, all lie dependent yeah um but really I, I i look at ball position a little bit more in relation to the to the chest bone the, the sternum bone so he wants to be in front of your sternum bone for this shot yeah, sure. because it's your wider stance and you're a little bit you know, you're forward of the, the lower body, upper body slightly back, the ball position will just be forward of the, of the sternum bone. 
This has been so wonderful. Uh, you've made it sound all so easy. Your de demonstrations have been so appropriate. I've kept you for a long time. Um, I would say personally, if I if I was leaving the listener and the viewer with marching orders, I would say, go and be cognizant of the lie before you select your shot, and then yeah. set up for the appropriate shot. Yeah. What 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 would if you had to leave someone to put a bow on your conversation? What would you say about having a bit more success around the greens? Yeah, reading the line is just absolutely number one. Reading the line and anticipating what will happen before it happens. Okay. Like, don't be surprised. You know, so let's say you're in, you're in the rough and you want to play a chip and run shot because you've got lots of green to work with, but the ball's sitting down. You know, the chip and run is not going to be the shot because it's going to be too shallow. It's going to get caught. Yeah. Or, you know, you might be on hard pan and trying to play a high shot. Anticipate, look at it and think, OK, if I play it this way, what will it be? What will happen if I if I change nothing? What will happen? You've got to be able to, to anticipate what will happen. And then from there, you can hopefully select the right club and the, and the right shot to play. I'm so glad you said that. I had a lesson yesterday where it wasn't that this individual's technique was poor he was playing poorly because he plays in a group of golfers that are like the fast play police. And it seems <laughs> to me like they get an award for who can play the round the quickest. And they just end up hitting more shots because they're racing through stuff. And yeah. where you go there and take a, just take a few seconds to really. It takes seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Trigger. yeah. Yeah. And have a practice swing as well next to the ball. And that'll give you a feel for how the grass is. It'll feel for how the ground is, how firm it is, you know, how soft it is. Yeah. There's a lot you can find out before before you play your shot. So don't be surprised after the shot that the ball grabbed or it ran too far or whatever. You just got to be a bit cleverer than that. So that means go and spend some time practicing too. Don't just go to the range all day long. Yeah, no, it's so fashionable to go and hit drivers and it? it's tempting to do that. But I promise you, if you go to the, range, uh, the short game area or the chipping green or or even in your living room, just chipping airflow balls onto the sofa, just to, can, you, can you chip it under a table or over a table? All that's just great practice. You don't... Yes, you, know, so you don't need a, a fantastic short game since like we've got it woven, as fantastic as it is, you know, we don't all have access to that. So you can you can be inventive about how you practice short game for sure. Mm. Slow hanging fruit, folks. Go do it. All right, Dan, you've been a star. You, I've kept you for so long. Please share for the folks website, social media, the like, where they can find you. If they're in the UK, they can obviously go visit you and book lessons. But for the rest of the world, but how can how can they follow you? Yeah, I'm on Instagram, uh, which is Dan Grieve, D A N G R I E V E golf and uh, got a website dggolfpro.com and uh, that's probably the best way to get in touch with me you're the best man this has been great stuff i really appreciate you thank you all right thank you mark it's been a pleasure